everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Messi, and today we are having a look at an interesting piece of vintage lighting equipment. This is a carbide lamp, and devices like these were used for many years in the early 20th century for home illumination, as headlamps for bicycles and automobiles, and for mining. And they're actually still used to a limited extent today by spelunkers, or cave explorers. Now, these work by reacting water with a chemical called calcium carbide to produce acetylene gas. And you might recognize acetylene gas as the gas used in traditional oxyacetylene welding or cutting. Now, the story of the carbide lamp begins in 1892 with a gentleman named Thomas Wilson. Now, Wilson was a Canadian engineer and inventor. He was born in 1860 in Princeton, Ontario. And he spent the early part of his career inventing dynamos and other electrical equipment and attempting to set up electrical distribution systems in cities across North America. He wasn't quite successful in this, so in 1891 he decided to devote his energies to developing a more economical process for producing aluminum, something to compete with the then dominant, and still dominant today, hall heru process. So Wilson partnered with a gentleman named James Turner Moorhead who ran a cotton mill in Spray, North Carolina, and he arranged to use the excess electricity produced by the mill's dam to run his experiments. And he started experimenting with a new piece of equipment known as an arc furnace. And this is a device that used an electric arc struck between two carbon rods to produce high temperatures higher temperatures than were possible using a traditional coke-fired furnace. This allowed a wider variety of chemical reactions to be carried out. And his plan was to use various compounds of calcium in an attempt to reduce the compound aluminum chloride and produce pure aluminum. And so he set about trying to synthesize various calcium compounds using his electric arc furnace. And as the story goes, on May 2nd, 1892, he was running an experiment in which he combined calcium hydroxide, or lime, with carbon in the form of powdered anthracite coal, and he ran this through the electric arc furnace. And this produced a hard, slaggy substance, which he immediately identified as calcium carbide. Now, it's important to note here that Thomas Wilson, or Carbide Wilson, as he later became known, didn't discover calcium carbide, he didn't discover acetylene, nor did he discover that reacting calcium carbide with water produces acetylene. All of those had already been discovered several decades before. However, the process that he invented turned out to be the most economical way of producing calcium carbide and, by extension, acetylene. And it turned out that acetylene had a lot of advantages over ordinary illuminating gas. It actually produced a flame 10 to 12 times brighter than ordinary coal gas, and with Wilson's process scaled up, he could produce calcium carbide for around $25 a ton, so it was highly competitive. So Wilson went into the carbide and acetylene business, and in 1895, a consortium was formed called Union Carbide to produce and distribute carbide and acetylene. And Wilson would eventually sell all of his patents to Union Carbide, which still exists to this day as a subsidiary of Dow Chemical. So, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, there were numerous applications for carbide and acetylene lighting, including home illumination. And these systems were mainly used in rural areas where people didn't have access to the main gas distribution grid. So, these systems would consist of a hopper outside the house that would be filled with calcium carbide pellets, and water would be dripped onto these pellets from another tank and the gas produced would then be piped into the house and burned in ordinary gas lamps. Now, in the early 1900s, we also saw the development of compact carbide lamps like this one, and those would be used on bicycles and later on automobiles as headlamps. And the first ones were developed in France, but the first one in North America was patented in 1900 by one Frederick Baldwin of New York, and this is the design that he patented. This is a Baldwin carbide pit lamp. Now, as that name implies, these were widely used in the mining industry, typically being attached to miners' helmets, where it produced a much brighter and more diffuse light than oil lamps of the period. Now, there was an exception to this. These were not used in coal mines, and that's because coal mines are notorious for producing flammable and explosive gases that have produced a lot of accidents over the years. 
Carbide lamps tend to have open flames, so coal miners still use the traditional Davy or safety lamp. And if you want to learn more about those, please check out my video on the topic, link in the description. So another common use of acetylene lighting was in lighthouses and light buoys, and one of the more common systems in use was the Dahlen light, invented in 1906 by Swedish physicist and inventor Gustav Dahlen. And his main innovation was something called a sun valve, which automatically turned on the gas, and thus the light, at night, thus conserving the gas supply and allowing lighthouses and light buoys to run autonomously. And this consisted of an assembly of metal rods, some of them painted black and some of them unpainted, so that when the sun struck the valve, the black painted rods would absorb more heat and expand more than the plain metal rods, and this differential expansion would open and close the gas valve. And interestingly enough, and this is about the only time I've ever heard of this happening for an engineering breakthrough, this innovation earned Dahlen the 1912 Nobel Prize in Physics. Now, Dahlen worked for the Aga Company of Sweden, which produced gas accumulators and other domestic gas handling equipment, and one of his other innovations in this field was something known as agamassin, and this was a substrate used to stabilize liquefied acetylene. Now, you could produce acetylene on demand by reacting water with calcium carbide, but this didn't produce nearly enough of a gas flow for certain applications, like welding. And so the ideal solution would have been to store acetylene in liquid form in a compressed gas cylinder. However, this proved to be extremely dangerous. The acetylene intended to detonate when you tried to do this, and indeed such an explosion led to Gustav Dahlen being blinded for the rest of his life. And so agamassin was found to be the solution. And so what you would do is you would dissolve the acetylene in acetone and then absorb the acetone into the substrate, which was a mixture of coal dust, cement, asbestos, or kaiselgur, which is a type of diatomaceous earth, and this would stabilize it and prevent it from detonating. And interestingly enough, if you know your history of explosives, you'll recognize kaiselgur as the exact same substance Alfred Nobel used to stabilize nitroglycerin and produce dynamite. Now, one thing you're probably wondering at this point is, why did carbide lamps survive for so long? Why were they so popular? Why hadn't electric lighting been invented in the early 1900s? Well, yes it had, but early electric incandescent bulbs weren't very efficient. They didn't produce a whole lot of light, and the batteries needed to run them were very heavy and bulky. Not ideal when you're working below ground, either in a mine or trying to explore a narrow cave. So in terms of the amount of light produced for the weight and bulk of the lamp, very little beats a carbide lamp, and indeed, it's only in recent years with the development of ultra-efficient LEDs and ultra-compact high-density batteries that is seen any competition in this field. And so this is why people continue to use them to this day. Other reasons as well, which we will get to. But now, without further ado, let's actually have a look at how this is constructed and how it works. So, You'll see that this is composed of two main sections. There is a lower reservoir, and this contains your chips of calcium carbide. Now again, because Spelunkers still use these, you can order calcium carbide online. Uh, there are shipping restrictions, mind you, because if this gets wet, it is a fire hazard, but you can still get your hands on it, and I'll show you on the camera just what this material looks like. So you put your chips of calcium carbide in the lower reservoir here, and you have an upper reservoir that screws onto it, which contains water. You fill it through this little cap in the top. Then you have this sliding needle valve, which allows you to change the flow of water dripping onto the calcium carbide. And as water drips onto the carbide, it reacts, it produces a settling gas. That flows through the holes in this bottom plate, that you can see here, and then out this little ceramic nozzle in the front, and this is where the gas burns. You have a reflector to gather and direct the light. A lot of carbide lamps will have a little striker assembly, which is like on a cigarette lighter. It's a little toothed wheel with a flint, so that you can light the flame without needing a separate match or striker. And there's also a bracket at the back here for hooking this onto a miner's helmet or onto a bicycle. So let's actually fill this up and fire it up and see what it looks like. 
So as you can see, this produces a surprisingly bright white light. And the reason for that is that when acetylene burns in ordinary air, the combustion is not complete. It produces quite a sooty flame. And the fine carbon particles that form that soot absorb heat from the flame and glow white hot, producing this bright light. Now, another thing to note is that when you're running one of these lamps, it produces quite a pungent smell. And that's because commercial grade calcium carbide has quite a few impurities in it, including compounds of phosphorus and sulfur. And so when water reacts with the carbide, it's going to produce trace amounts of the gases phosphine and hydrogen sulfide, which give this a very garlicky odor. Now, those are highly toxic gases, but they're produced in such trace quantities that running a carbide lamp is not dangerous at all. Also, the reaction between calcium carbide and water is exothermic, so this reaction vessel gets quite warm. And for the spelunkers who like to use these, that's a feature, not a bug, because if you're exploring a dark, cold cave, hey, you have a ready-made hand warmer at your disposal. The sooty flame also comes in handy, a lot of spelunkers will use these to mark trails. They'll hold the lamp up to the cave wall and the flame will leave a sooty smudge, which they can use to guide themselves back up to the surface. And indeed, so soldiers have been issued smaller versions of carbide lamps known as smokers or carbide candles to blacken the sights on their weapons to prevent glare from the sun from interfering with your aim. So a very versatile, very useful, and surprisingly long-lived piece of lighting tech, and one of my favorite items in my personal collection. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities, where I'll look at yet more neat vintage tech just like this. Until then, I'm Jean Nessier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.